Hey everyone, I wanted to provide a little update on fasting as it pertains to coronavirus. Um, first thing I want to just say is I want to make sure everybody kind of understands the framework around how we're thinking about this. And maybe before watching this video, it's worth watching some of the other videos that we'll be linking to because it's in those videos that I think we're kind of explaining some of the background and um, some of the rationale for the, the decisions that, that many of us are making. Um, I don't think it can be overstated that the single most important thing right now is time. You see, right now there's a lot of uncertainty and the problem with uncertainty is it leads to poor decision making. Um, and with more certainty uh, comes obviously more optionality. So how do we buy time? Well, right now the only thing that we know is true is not getting the virus is better than getting the virus. And we can sit here and debate what the mortality is of people who get the virus. Um, and surely those numbers are going to get better and better as time goes on. But if there's anything you can do to avoid getting the virus in the first place, as we learn more about who's more susceptible or less susceptible, and perhaps more importantly, what treatments are available beyond um, the most extreme measures of supportive care, the better we'll be. And so social distancing remains, uh, certainly for the past week, in my mind, the single most important thing that you can do. Nothing comes close to that, actually. And I think what you're seeing in the past few days is the rest of the country, um, from a policy level, is indeed waking up to that. And I think where we were uh, seven days ago, which was March 6th, versus where we are today, March 13th, at the time of this recording, um, is basically the scientific world, which a week ago was sort of saying this, now being caught up to by um, the policy world. So again, if you're reading this and you're, pardon me, if you're watching this and you're thinking, do I really need to care about this? I'm young, I'm healthy. Uh, the answer is absolutely you do, because even a young, healthy person is not immune from the complications of this, even though their odds of having a complication are lower. But of course, more importantly, you could be asymptomatic and you can be transmitting the virus to somebody who's not going to be as lucky. So with all that said, what do we need to do with respect to um, how we're eating as it pertains to reducing our risk of contracting the virus? I think it's safe to say we don't actually know. Um, and to suggest otherwise is probably a bit irresponsible. Now, in my mind, I'm breaking this problem into a two by two, which I've drawn here. So part of what we're saying is, what is it about fasting in the actual fasted state versus in the post-fasted state um, that affects your immune system or your response to the virus or resilience to actually getting the disease? In other words, your immune system plays a role in you potentially being more or less likely to contract the virus, SARS-CoV-2. But then there's something that goes beyond your immune system, which is, does your body actually go on to develop COVID-19? So COVID-19, of course, is the disease. SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. So you have sort of in the fasted state, post-fasted state, immune response, resilience to the disease. Well, we don't know the answer to these because um, we, we can only speculate on some things. So, so let me tell you what we can speculate on. We know from physiologic studies that have examined um, people fasting over prolonged periods of time that long fasts, and we kind of define that as three, four days beyond with water only, um, have a number of physiologic changes, but one of them is an increase in cortisol. That's a short-term transient response to fasting that obviously makes sense from an evolutionary perspective, and we've discussed this in other um, question and answer sessions. But it's at least theoretically possible that if you have a short-term rise in cortisol, it could actually weaken your immune system. Now, that link is not clear. Um, in other words, we don't know if the immune system is actually weakened during a prolonged fast, but certainly the precautionary principle would suggest that if we know cortisol levels tend to go up during prolonged fasts, then the safe thing to do is assume that our immune system is somewhat compromised, and therefore that would render us more susceptible to the virus. And so even though I don't know that to be true, 
And I hope that in time, we will have better insight into that. For now, what I'm telling my patients is we should refrain from prolonged periods of fasting. And we're somewhat arbitrarily drawing a line in the sand and calling that 48 hours. Because that's about when we see that physiologic switch kick in to people based on long-term fasting studies where those cortisol levels go up. Now, of course, what we don't know is, uh, but we are extrapolating that post-fasting, people's immune system tends to get stronger. That said, it is still my view that it makes sense not to undergo prolonged fasting until we have more information, because even though you might actually become less susceptible to the virus post-fast, there's a chance that during the fast, of course, it backfires. So that kind of addresses the bottom row here, which is fasting and how it may or may not impact your resilience to contracting the virus. As far as your resilience to the disease, um, it also is not clear, but it seems unlikely that fasting will increase your susceptibility to the disease based on everything we know about how this virus interacts with the ACE2 receptor and with the type of cells that um, express that receptor, the most important of those being something called the type 2 pneumocyte, which is a cell in the lung that makes surfactant. And so from the standpoint of that, it's not clear that fasting would offer some enormous protection from the disease that would thereby override our decision to take a conservative stance with respect to uh, avoiding the virus. Again, I know this is a bit complicated, but I do think it's important to break it into the idea of the virus, meaning the susceptibility to the virus, and then of course the susceptibility to the disease that about 20% of people infected with the virus will go on to get. So what does this mean for other types of fasting, such as time-restricted feeding? Well, I see absolutely no reason why a healthy amount of time-restricted feeding and dietary restriction, which would otherwise still be the mainstays of responsible eating, pose any concern. Um, I am still continuing to eat probably about two meals a day. So I might have kind of a lunch and a dinner and that's about it. Um, the other day I just had one meal per day. Um, and I don't see any evidence in the literature to suggest that that type of eating is in any way um, rendering me either more susceptible to the virus or more susceptible to the disease. If anything right now matters, it's probably dietary restriction. And if I'm going to be brutally honest, I have found in the last two weeks my craving for crap is higher in large part because I'm quite sequestered right now. I'm not going out. I'm largely quarantined. Um, and as a result of that, I'm simply around more processed food that is sitting around in my pantry. And so um, what I'm really trying to do is, is, is be more diligent about not eating junk food um, because if there's anything that we know is going to pose a little bit of a threat to your immune system, it is in fact um, low quality food. And there's probably reasonable evidence that, that sugar would, would fit into that, um, that group and, and certainly other refined and processed foods. So if, if you, like me, kind of exist on a continuum where sometimes you're really pushing the fasting envelope, sometimes you're pushing the time-restricted envelope, and sometimes, you, sometimes you're pushing on the dietary restriction envelope, I suspect this is a time to be more robust on the dietary restriction side of things and use this as an opportunity to kind of double down on eating cleaner, but not necessarily focusing, focusing on restricting the number of calories you're eating, and certainly to our point a moment ago about being more conservative, not necessarily pushing on um, prolonged periods of fasting. So again, in summary, we are at this point not recommending that our patients fast for a period of beyond two days, and instead we're focusing on eating as well as you can, and with the understanding that that does not give you immunity. Nothing at this point is going to be more important than social distancing, and while that is an enormous ask for many people, and it may seem draconian, it may seem overly pessimistic. Um, it is much better, in my opinion, based on the asymmetry of this threat, to be a little more conservative at this point in time and to look back and think, you know what, we probably spent a little too much effort on this uh, than the reverse, which is to be sitting here 
um, in the presence of a healthcare system that is potentially overrun and failing and wishing that we did more to distance ourselves, to protect ourselves and protect the people we care about. So I hope you find this helpful and obviously we'll continue to provide updates as more and more information becomes available.